Well, good morning, Grace Fellowship. It's great to be with you this morning, preparing for the cold coming. Lisa and I were wrapping our pipes and covering our bushes yesterday. The cold is coming. Thanks for getting out in the cold. It's the vision of Grace Fellowship to be a house of prayer for all nations by making disciples who make disciples. And one way we do that around here is by studying God's word together here in Big Church. So let's do that. If you look on page three of your worship guide, you'll find some sermon notes there. I encourage you to get out a pen, get ready to take some notes. If you're online, click the button that says worship guide and you can find the same sermon notes uh, as well. And then if you got a Bible, turn with me in your Bible to the book of 1 Kings. That's Old Testament, about 25% of the way through your Bible. Uh, 1 Kings comes after 1 and 2 Samuel. We're going to be looking at 1 Kings chapter 17. Uh, We're in the sermon series called uh, My 40-Day Faith Assignment. We're taking six Sundays to study the life of the prophet Elijah in the book of 1 Kings. And today we're going to look at Elijah taking a faith risk in 1 Kings chapter uh, 17. So I'm constantly hearing new phrases and learning new phrases from my adult children and uh, my youngest son, John David, a couple years back, taught me a new phrase I'd never heard before. Uh, I was proposing to John David that he and I go out and do something a little bit risky together and maybe uh, drive some race cars together. And we were talking about that. And he said, yeah, Dad, let's risk it for the biscuit. And I'm like, yeah, I like that. Let's risk it for the biscuit. Well, recently I, I read of a man by the name of Bill Irwin who took risk it for the biscuit to a whole nother level. Bill Orwin hiked the Appalachian Trail, the whole thing. The Appalachian Trail is 2,100 miles uh, starting in Springer, Georgia and going all the way up through the Appalachian Mountains, all the way up to a mountain in Maine. Hiking this trail is an amazing feat for anyone, but what made Bill Irwin's hike so amazing is that he's blind. (laughs) He's blind. Accompanied only by his German shepherd, it took Bill eight months to hike the 2,100-mile trail, enduring snow and rain and heat and cold, sleeping on the ground, fording streams, shivering in the cold. He fell down. He fell down an average of 20 times per day for eight months straight, but he got back up. Bill was 50 years old when he set out on this hike. A recovering alcoholic and a committed Christian, he memorized 2 Corinthians 5, 7 as his repeated slogan throughout his eight months. For we walk by faith, not by sight. For we walk by faith, not by sight. There's a book about Bill Irwin called Blind Courage. And someone used that book to make a movie concept trailer. Movie has not come out yet, but watch this Uh, movie trailer of Bill Irwin. Watch this. You don't really think a blind man and a dog is going to last long out here, do you? I don't know. But the harder something is, the more it's worth in the long run. So why are you doing this, Bill? To say thank you to God. That's where we For what? For saving my life. Hard. You ever think about quitting? <gasps> Every day. How do you know which way to go? I don't. Just follow him. How does he know? God leads the dog, the dog leads me.
it's incredibly inspiring to me. Uh, Bill Oren risked it for the biscuit to say thank you to God for saving him from alcoholism. Um, This morning, I want us to look at two people in the Bible who risked it for the biscuit, a man by the name of Elijah and a widow woman who lived in the town called Zarephath. We started to get to know Elijah last week. Last week, we learned that Elijah was a prophet whom God called to deliver a very difficult message to King Ahab and the Jewish people. King Ahab and Queen Jezebel, whenever you're hearing her name, just hear ominous music playing in the background. King Ahab and Queen Jezebel were two of the most wicked rulers that Israel had ever had in their history up to that point. And God gives Elijah a faith assignment to confront King Ahab and declare a three and a half year drought to wake up the whole nation of Israel to their sin and to their idolatry and to bring them back to the Lord. And in the midst of this very difficult faith assignment, Elijah's number one tool is fervent prayer. Last week, we embraced the New Year's 40-day challenge together, namely to listen to God and discern what his Elijah-like faith assignment is for you and for me and then to trust God to complete that uh, in and through your life. And so I'm curious, what faith assignment is God giving to you in this season of your life? I believe that you're gonna get the most out of our time this morning and actually in the whole series if you uh, discern what that faith assignment is. So what is the faith assignment that God's calling you to in this season of your life? Write it down and you'll get the most out of our time uh, this morning. I believe that studying the life of Elijah in 1 Kings can help us with our faith assignment. As I've studied the entire, entirety of 1 Kings chapter 17, uh, we're going to hear one phrase repeated over and over again this morning. The phrase, the word of the Lord. Uh, five different times today, we'll hear the word of the Lord came to Elijah. The word of the Lord came to Elijah. Or such and such happened according to the word of the Lord. According to the word of the Lord. As we read 1 Kings 17, look for that phrase, the word of the Lord. So can I summarize the entirety of 1 Kings 17 for us? I put this in your notes. Here's the whole message this morning, just in one sentence. God grants you favor and provision in your faith assignment as you hear, believe, and obey his word. So the first fill in the blank there in your notes is his word. God grants you favor and provision in your faith assignment as you hear, believe, and obey his word. You want to have the faith to carry out your 2024 faith assignment? Then saturate yourself with the word of God. Hear it, believe it, and act on it. That's the message of 1 Kings 17. It's also the message of Romans 10, 17, where God says, uh, faith comes through hearing and hearing through the word of God. If you want to have the faith to carry out your faith assignment, then saturate yourself with the word of God, hearing it, believing it, and obeying it. All right, let's say a prayer, and then we're going to dive into 1 Kings 17 uh, together. Pray with me, please. And if you brought a Bible with you, I just invite you to hold your Bible in the air. just as a symbol of submitting yourself to God and to his word. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, change my life through your word. Do whatever you want. Amen. All right, here we go. First Kings chapter 17. We'll start in verse 1. Now Elijah the Tishbite of Tishbe in Gilead said to King Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. And we spent the entire last Sunday just studying that verse, getting the background to First Kings and the background to Elijah. Let's keep going. Verse 2. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah. If you're an underliner, underline that in your Bible. It's the theme of this chapter. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Here's what God said. Elijah, depart from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. You shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So Elijah went and did according to the word of the Lord. There it is again, underline it. If you're an underliner, underline it. So Elijah went and did according to the word of the Lord. He went and lived by the brook Cherith that is east of the Jordan. 
And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. And he drank from the brook. So Elijah prayed for a drought in order to get everybody's attention. And now Elijah's got to live in the midst of that drought. And so let's process what we're reading so far. Look with me in your notes. Uh, Let's look at three Elijah-like faith postures to take in response to God's word. Three Elijah-like faith postures for you and I to take uh, in response to God's word. So here we go, posture number one. As you hear God's word for your situation, believe it and act on it. So the next fill in the blank there is act on it. As you hear God's word for your situation, believe it and act on it. So Elijah heard the word of the Lord to go east of the Jordan to the Cherith Brook. Elijah believed God's word, he acted on God's word, and God provided for his physical and material needs. But this took an act of faith to go where God told him to go because Cherith Brook, east of the Jordan, is a really hard place. Look at what Priscilla Shire says about this. She says, all the land east of the Jordan was rugged and unkempt. Dotted with a variety of mountains and hills, its valleys were as deep as its peaks were high. It was known for its long stretches of lonely wasteland. And then what's fascinating is that God chose a bird, ravens, that Jews considered unclean to be the waiters and waitresses to deliver Elijah's food to him. Hey, Elijah, I want you to go to a wasteland And there I'm going to send ravens to feed you. That's a stretch. (laughs) That's a stretch. But here's what I found in my life. Many times God calls me to do things that stretch me. Many times God calls me to do things that stretch me. So let's pause for a second and let's make it personal. Look at application number one there in your notes. From what you've heard so far in 1 Kings 17, what's God saying to you? Will you believe and act on God's word even when it seems a stretch like Cherith Brook and the Ravens? Elijah acted on God's word even when it involved Cherith Brook and the Ravens. Will you believe and act on God's word even when it seems a stretch like Cherith Brook and the Ravens? Specifically, will you believe and act on God's word calling you to, and then I just took a bunch of scriptures that I think are a stretch. I think they're a difficult to obey and and maybe one of these will speak to you or maybe there's a specific scripture God has for you but specifically are you willing to believe and act on God's word calling you to love people who are hard to love are you willing to believe and act on God's word calling you to forgive people who have hurt you are you willing to believe and act on God's word calling you to serve those around you calling you to spend time in silence Calling you to give the first portion of your income back to God. Calling you to save your sexuality for marriage. Calling you to love your wife sacrificially like Jesus loves the church. Calling you to respect your husband winsomely. Calling you to do all things without complaining. Wow, that's a stretch. (laughs) This MLK weekend, I've been thinking about Martin Luther King Jr. He was an Elijah to America calling us to justice. Uh, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. had a really difficult faith assignment that stretched him and ultimately got him killed. But he followed God's word. Specifically, he followed Amos 5.24. And he acted on God's word, carrying out the assignment that God gave to him. Uh, Watch Dr. King in action, carrying out his faith assignment. Watch this hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Yeah. Yeah. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will they be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood? I have a dream. I have a dream. That my four little children 
will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. So the word of the Lord came to Martin Luther King Jr. And specifically the word was Amos 524. And he acted, he believed on and acted on that word. So I'm wondering for your situation, your faith assignment in 2024, has God given you a word? Uh, and if not, will you pray and ask him to give you a scripture that goes hand in hand with the faith assignment that he's uh, given to you? For me in my faith assignment in 2024, I, f- I feel like God's given me Hebrews 12, 1 through 3, as the scripture that I'm going to believe and act on. I put this in your notes. Uh, Hebrews 12, the Bible says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider Jesus who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. And specifically the phrase in here that God's calling me to in this season of my life is fix your eyes on Jesus, Joe. That's the scripture I'm meditating on and that I'm uh, doing hand in hand with my faith assignment. Ask God to give you a scripture to go hand in hand with the faith assignment he's given you. All right, posture number two. As you hear God's word for your situation, be willing to humble yourself as God uses unlikely means to accomplish his purposes. So the next fill in the blank there is humble yourself. As you hear God's word for your situation, be willing to humble yourself as God uses unlikely means to accomplish his purposes. So let's pick up where we left off, verse 7. 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 7. And after a while, the Cherith brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah. If you're underlining in your scriptures, underline it right there. It's the third time he's used this phrase. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So Elijah arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And Elijah called to her and said, Bring me a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, Bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. And now I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and make a fire and prepare the flour and oil that I have left for myself and my son that we may eat it and die because then we have nothing left to eat. And Elijah said to her, do not fear. Do not fear. Go and do as you have said, but first make me a little cake of it and bring it to me And then afterward, make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of flour shall not be spent. It's going to keep going. And the jug of oil shall not be empty. It's going to keep going until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. And so the widow went and did as Elijah said. And she and Elijah and her household ate for many days. The jar of flour was not spent. It did not run out. Neither did the jug of oil become empty. According to the word of the Lord. There it is again. Underline it if you're underlining. According to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. After the Cherith Brook dries up, God now uses a Gentile, a non-Jewish person, to meet Elijah's needs. And he doesn't just use a Gentile, he uses a Gentile widow to meet Elijah's needs. And he doesn't just use a Gentile widow, he lives, he uses a Gentile widow who lives near the hometown of Jezebel. Hear ominous music playing in the background. Zarephath is 
in the region. It's right next to Jezebel's hometown of Sidon. It took much faith and humbleness for Elijah to travel from east of the Jordan to come to Jezebel's territory and to seek out a widow to provide for his needs. But I believe it took even more faith and humbleness for the widow to share her final meal before starvation of her and her son, to share her final meal with a transient man who claims he's heard from God. I find the faith of Elijah and I find the faith of this widow woman to be absolutely amazing. Now, in both cases, they have a part and God has a part. And I put a little chart here in your notes that's helpful to me uh, to realize in, in, in every miracle, uh, there's our part and there's God's part. So for Elijah, Elijah's part was to leave Cherith Brook, travel to uh, Zarephath and seek out the widow. God's part was to do the miracle, to supernaturally provide for Elijah's needs. For the widow, the widow's part was to share her final meal with Elijah by faith. That's her part. God's part was to do the miracle of supernaturally multiplying the flour and the oil. And so as you think about your situation, whatever it is here in 2024, and what your faith assignment is, I think it's helpful to distinguish between God's part and your part. And so I just gave you a little blank there for you to write in what, what's my part and what's uh, God's part. There's a young lady in our congregation named CJ who believes that God has given her a faith assignment to give her life to taking the gospel to one of our unreached people groups in the Caucasus Mountains. Now, for security reasons, I'm not going to name the people group on camera online right now. The word of the Lord came to CJ just like the word of the Lord came to Elijah. And CJ's part is to say yes and then to prepare and to pray and to go. And then when she gets there to share the gospel, that's CJ's part. God's part is to provide for her and to protect her and to work supernaturally orchestrating gospel conversations in the hearts of people that he's preparing uh, to draw to himself through Jesus. Back to Elijah. The town that God called Elijah to go to is Zarephath. And the Hebrew word Zarephath literally means smelting furnace or refining fire. <laughs> so Zarephath becomes a refining fire for both Elijah and this widow. And I believe that refining fire is a powerful illustration for all of us. Do you know how a refiner does his work? If a refiner has gold that has impurities in it and he wants to purify that gold, he takes that gold and he sticks it in an, in an iron pot. And then he takes that iron pot full of solid gold bars in it and he lights the fire underneath it and he cranks up that furnace underneath that melting pot. And the gold begins to melt inside that pot and it gets hot. And as it does, density causes the impurities inside that gold to rise to the top and the refiner takes a scraper and he scrapes off the impurities that have risen to the top. Then he cranks up the heat some more and more impurities rise to the top and he scrapes those impurity off the top, cranks it some more, scrapes the impurities. And the steel worker, the refiner knows that the gold is purified when he can look down inside in the pot and see his reflection in the gold, the purified gold. Oh, Grace Fellowship, your loving father is a refiner. And he will occasionally take you and he will occasionally take me to Zarephath, where the heat of our circumstances will melt us. And it's not fun. It's painful to be melted. And our loving, heavenly, refining father scrapes our impurities off the top as they rise to the top in the heat. Then he heats some more. And he scrapes some more of those impurities. And our Heavenly Father knows that he's purified us when he looks down upon us 
and he can see the reflection of his son in us. He loves us and he loves us too much to leave us the way we are. He's a refiner. I'm wondering what Zarephath situation are you encountering right now? What Zarephath refining, heating up in the pot situation do you find yourself in right now? And how might God be using that unlikely scenario to purify you and to accomplish his purposes? Did you notice what Elijah said in verse 13? He says to the widow, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I love what Rick Warren says about this. He says, it's interesting to note that there are 365 verses in the Bible that say, fear not. God has provided us with one fear not for every day of the year. 365. He wants us to hear daily the message, don't be afraid. I've got you. Don't be afraid. And so would you come to the prayer altar in just a couple of minutes and pray application number two and say, Lord, by faith, I choose to fear not. Jesus, I invite you to purify me and I ask for your grace and your power to humble myself and to trust you. I choose to trust you. I choose to fear not. I know if I was CJ or if I was CJ's parents, I would be tempted to fear. A faith assignment of moving away from everything you know to a Muslim nation in the Caucasus Mountains, that is not an easy assignment. And yet God says to CJ and to you and to me, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Fear not. Watch this video about CJ. I apologize to our online viewers. For security reasons, you're not going to see the pictures in this video. You're just going to hear uh, the audio. Um, here's CJ's story. Listen to this. I never heard about unreached people groups until I got to college. I started praying and I started asking God, what can I do about this? Who am I to make an impact on God's kingdom? When I first went to this country, I was not expecting to be called to go there long term. As I was flying back to the U.S., I had my, my Bible and my journal out and I'm just journaling and just asking the Lord, what are you doing? What are you trying to tell me? I just really clearly heard him say, uh, the wait is over, the door is open, it's time to go. A few weeks later, I got to go on a prayer retreat. Over 40 people had messaged me back and they had had dreams. They had had the Lord bring to mind some, some verses. Um, they had seen pictures or um, just received phrases. And every single one of them was encouraging me, was affirming that this is the Lord's leading. And I think the most special one was that my dad um, just felt this overwhelming peace from the Lord um, that has really made him so much more confident to send his, you know, his single daughter overseas to a Muslim majority country. I just really believe that God is a God who speaks, just knowing he's with me in this process. And even if I have no idea what I'm doing, he does and he will see me through. He says in his word that um, it's in our weakness that his power is made perfect. God just really impressed upon me that it's not about what I bring to the table. For every single thing that I lack, it's just another opportunity for him to provide and to show up. We can trust that when he calls us into something, he will provide for us. CJ is fully funded. She has a one-way plane ticket to the Caucasus Mountains that leaves this Thursday. And we're going to say a prayer over her at the end of the service uh, here. All right, number three, a third posture of Elijah for us to learn from. Number three, as you hear God's word for your situation, believe that nothing is impossible with God. Uh, so the last fill in the blank there is nothing is impossible. As you hear God's word for your situation, believe that nothing is impossible with God. So let's pick up where we left off, verse 17, 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 17. 
After this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became ill. The widow's son became ill. And his illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. He died. And the widow said to Elijah, What have you against me, O man of God? You have come to bring to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son. And Elijah said to her, Give me your son. And Elijah took him from her arms and carried him up into the upper chamber where he lodged and laid him on his own bed. And Elijah cried to the Lord, O Lord, my God, have you brought calamity even upon the widow with whom I sojourn by killing her son? By the way, it's okay to talk to God like that. (coughs) God can handle how we're feeling. Then Elijah stretched himself upon the child three times and cried to the Lord, O Lord, my God, let this child's life come into him again. And the Lord listened to the voice of Elijah. And the life of the child came into him again, and the child revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper chamber into the house and delivered him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. And the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord, if you're underlining, there it is for the fifth time, and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. Bible scholar Robert Vinoy says, this is the first instant of raising the dead recorded in the Bible. It's the first time somebody's risen from the dead. This non-Israelite Gentile widow was granted the supreme covenant blessing, the gift of life rescued from the power of death. The blessing came in the person of her son, the only hope for a widow in ancient society. This is amazing. Elijah prayed that this boy would rise from the dead, and he did. Nothing is impossible for God. Nothing is impossible for God. That's what Jeremiah said. I put this scripture in your notes, Jeremiah 32, 17. He says, ah, sovereign Lord, you've made the heavens and the earth by your great power and your outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for you. Nothing is too difficult for you. Would you come to the prayer altar in just a minute and would you pray a prayer like application number three and and say, Sovereign Lord, nothing is too difficult for you. In the same way that you raised the widow's son from the dead, I'm asking you to, and then ask him. Ask him. Even if it seems impossible, ask him. Maybe you'd say, I'm asking you to resurrect my life. I acknowledge that I'm dead spiritually. I'm separated from you, God. I repent of my sins and I turn to you, Jesus, to save me from my sin, the death, the devil, and myself. Jesus, I receive you into my life. Make me into a new person. Come to the prayer altar and say, Lord, I'm asking you to resurrect my family. I'm asking you to resurrect my marriage. I'm asking you to resurrect my job. I'm asking you to resurrect uh, my finances. Watch this video as uh, Jeremy and Lori share their testimony of God resurrecting their marriage. Watch this. Hi, I'm Lori West. I'm Jeremy West. We've been married uh, 23 years this summer and we have five kids. It's not been happily ever after necessarily. The first three years were... First three years were amazing. Yeah, we were really in love with each other, just kind of... You know, couldn't keep Mushy our hands kishy. off of each other, and uh, it was really great. It was then we had kids. And then <laughs> things changed. And, and that uh, brought struggles. It did, you know, and a part of it was I no longer felt like I was kind of her attention, and I needed that attention, and, uh, you know, the kids now kind of took most of her attention away. And then after a while, I just started believing lies that, you know, she didn't really love me, that she didn't really care about my feelings, and, and then we just started to, to really get disconnected. Yeah, when we focus on those lies, uh, and we don't always know that they're lies, they're our feelings. We call them our feelings a lot of times, um, but they feel real, and, and that started building an even greater wedge. So for the next two years, as we tried to work on our relationship, um, he... It, we weren't getting very far and the reason being we found out later was we went to a marriage conference where the theme was nothing hidden and we realized that there were things that were hidden and when those things are hidden 
we can't connect totally. Anything that's in the dark is in enemy territory. And he has power to put his thumb on it and to bring shame and condemnation. And so during that marriage conference um, out in California, God brought to light. Jeremy was willing to share some things. I was willing to share some things. God rocked his world. I came home with a totally different husband. And what God showed us through the process is that for us to be one, to be united, um, we really had to get individual healing. It was like he was covered in sores, I was covered in sores, and no matter how loving we tried to be to each other, if I hugged him and he was covered in sores, he would recoil and say, ow, you're hurting me, it's all your fault, and vice versa. So until he was willing to get healing for the things you were struggling with, until I was willing to get healing for my hurts, wounds, baggage, things from the past, we couldn't be truly connected. So the key to the change and the um, in our marriage to set us free was really transparency and honesty and being willing to go there with God, with Holy Spirit, to get healing, to recognize I own my issues, he owns his issues, um, and then to encourage you guys to keep going that God's promises over you and your marriage are true. You know, his promises are yes and amen, and to hold on to those promises. So the word that I, that I hold on to is the word hope, which is a confident expectation of good things and that it's an acronym, hold on to promises every day um, or hold on to promises eternal, that that is what kept us, kept me, I know definitely through the, the worst several years of our marriage. Um, and mine is just don't give up. Don't ever, ever, ever get up, give up because you're going to want to. It's going to feel like you want to and you're going to feel like sometimes you're going to be better off without this person next to you, but that's a lie. Stay committed. Yes, stay connected. Stay connected. Wow. Hey, a couple of great resources for your marriage. Uh, one is a class that we offer here at Grace Fellowship called Marriage Matters. And it's getting ready to start in a few weeks. On the second to last page in your worship guide, uh, you'll find uh, several classes described and how you can find those classes. One of those is Marriage Matters. Another great resource is a conference, of, a weekend marriage conference called Family Life Weekend to Remember. And if you just Google Family Life Weekend to Remember, uh, the uh, webpage can tell you all about it. They offer it about 50 different times all across the U.S. Lisa and I have been three times, and uh, we highly recommend it. Um, and, and don't go to one in Houston. Like, go to one in San Antonio or Austin or, or Dallas or the Woodlands. Like, get away a little bit uh, together. Hey, I am a big believer that we have a God who can resurrect your marriage. We have a God who can resurrect your family. We have a God who can resurrect your job and your finances and whatever your situation uh, is. So come to the prayer altar in just a minute and ask God for a miracle. Ask God to do a resurrection. Now, after saying that, let me say this. Not all of my prayers for miracles have always been answered in the ways that I wanted them to. And my guess is, is that some of you can relate to that. You've been praying for a job for a year, and you still don't have a job. You've been praying for God to provide you with a lifetime mate for years and years, and you're still single. You've been praying for God to heal you or heal your loved one, and you're still not healed. Three different times in my life, I've prayed literally for someone to rise from the dead. Um, I'll never forget being in a hospital in California, praying for a young woman who had just had a heart-lung transplant, and she died. And I stood in her hospital room and I had so much confidence and so much faith. I knew that I knew that I knew God was going to answer my prayer. And I prayed that God would raise her from the dead. I declared it out loud. I commanded her like Jesus commanded Lazarus. And she didn't come back to life. Why did God answer Elijah's prayer to resurrect the widow's son? But he didn't answer my prayer for my friend in California to come back to life? I don't fully know the answer to that question. But I want to share with you some answers that I found in the Bible that have been helpful to me. So if you look at the chart in your notes that says the mystery of unanswered prayer, uh, let me just share a little bit with you. As I've studied the Bible, I've learned that God actually always answers prayers. But sometimes his answer is no. <laughs> sometimes his answer is slow. Sometimes his answer is grow. 
And sometimes his answer is go, which just rhymes. It's yes. Um, sometimes God's answer is no. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 5 that not all of our prayer requests are in accordance with God's will. And when a prayer does not line up with God's will for a particular situation, God's answer is no. The classic example of this in Luke chapter 9 is when Jesus' disciples come to him and say, Hey, Jesus, uh, we're going to call down fire from heaven to destroy the Samaritans. And Jesus says, No. The answer is no. In Mark chapter 10, James and John ask to be the ones that get to sit at the right hand of Jesus in his kingdom. And Jesus says, no. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, David asked God to heal his baby infant son. And we learn that the answer is no. Sometimes God says no. And I don't, I don't fully understand all the reasons why he says no. But I believe one day in heaven, I will understand. Sometimes God says no. Sometimes God says slow. Sometimes God says, I actually am going to say yes to your prayer request, but not yet. The timing isn't right for some reasons that you'll find out in eternity. There is a time and a season for everything. Sometimes God says slow. Sometimes God says grow. Sometimes God says, I'm eventually going to say yes to your request, but first I need you to grow. Classic example of this is 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, where God says to husbands, I will not answer your prayer if you're not treating your wife in a loving and understanding way. Hello, Sometimes, men, God's waiting for us to grow before and, and love for our wife and the way we treat our wife before he's going to say yes to some other requests that we're asking. Sometimes God says no. Sometimes God says slow. Sometimes God says grow. But God's favorite answer is go. Yes, it's my favorite answer too. And I trust my loving Heavenly Father who knows best when to say no, when to say slow, when to say grow, and when to say go. If you examined my track record of prayer over decades and you gave me a school grade in terms of percentage of my prayers answered with a yes, I would get an F. <laughs> I, I, I'm just here to say less than 70% of my prayers have been answered with a yes over the last decades. So if you apply a school grade system to me, I get an F. However, if you apply a batting average score to me, Ty Cobb, the best batter in all of baseball history, had a batting average of 0.366. That means for every thousand pitches that were pitched at him, he hit three, 366, which means he didn't hit 634. If you, if you evaluate me by batting average, I'm World Series material, baby. <laughs> and that just helps me. This whole no slow grow go thing and not thinking about it in school letter grade terms but in batting average terms lines up with my experience and I trust my heavenly father. A prayer that I found super helpful in my life regarding this whole topic we're talking about right now uh, is the serenity prayer. And I put this in your notes and we'll also put it up here on the screen. I just want to invite us to say this prayer out loud together in unison, if you're willing to. Uh, would you say this prayer with me together? Here we go. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking as you did 
this sinful world as it is, not as I would like it, trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will, that I may be reasonably happy in this world and supremely happy in the next. That's a good prayer. All right, we're done. That's the message. Now, what are you going to do with what you've heard from God's word today? Uh, Along the way, I've suggested some applications. Uh, And then here in your notes, I've put uh, some some biggies here at the end. My application today, number one, I'm going to get into the word of God. The assumption behind everything that we've been hearing today is that that you're hearing the word of God. Um, You can't believe and act on the word of God unless you're hearing the word of God. So I'm going to cultivate the habit of reading God's word daily and hearing it weekly in big church. Number two, theme scripture. I'm going to find a theme scripture. I'm going to ask God for a theme scripture. With God's leading, I'm going to choose one theme scripture that corresponds to my 40-day faith assignment. And I'm going to memorize it and pray it frequently back to God. And number three, refiner's fire. I choose to yield my life to the Lord as he refines me and shapes me into the person that he wants me to be. I want the Lord to look down at me and see the reflection of Jesus. Lord, please do that. Well, the prayer altar is open. You can pray in your seat if you'd like to, but I found it powerful to get out of my seat and come and take a posture of kneeling uh, at the prayer altar railing up here. If you come down here to pray, uh, we're gonna leave you alone unless you'd like one of us to pray with you. Uh, And the symbol for that is to cup your hands while you're kneeling at the altar. We'd love to pray with you. I'm going to be down here praying through my applications. I invite you to come and pray as well.